This is Living Waters of Grace, the teaching ministry of Lewis Harrell, assistant pastor of Calvary Chapel of Westmoreland County in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. Now here's Pastor Lewis as he continues teaching through God's Word. Then he says that we're cast down, but we're not destroyed. You can talk about us, you can slander us, you can beat us down, but it won't take our spirit. It won't take what we know that we have. It doesn't matter what you say about us. You can't take what Jesus Christ has given us, and we will get back up. The Bible says a a good man will fall down seven times and get back up. We can be beat down, sin may get to us, uh, temptation may get to us, but we get back up. What does encouragement mean to you? To Pastor Lewis, it means you get back up when the world gets you down. You get back up when the people around you call you a failure. When the enemy attacks you saying that you'll never be good enough for God because of what you'll always be, Pastor Lewis tells you to get back up. In today's message, you'll learn that failing isn't the end of your relationship with the Lord. It only ends when you stop trying. Grab onto the truth that is the Word of God. Now here's Pastor Lewis in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3 with today's edition of Living Waters of Grace. So as we go to 1 Peter chapter 3, we left off at the bottom of uh, the 15th verse. But I want to go back and just recap verses 13 all the way down to verse, to bottom of verse 16. And I'm just going to read it and then we're going to go back and we're going to talk a little bit about it. But it says... And who is he who will harm you if you become followers of what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you. With meekness and fear. Having a good conscience that when they defame you as an evildoer, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. I'm going to read verse 17 as well. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Peter teaches out of his experience. (laughs) As you go through this and you look at Peter's life, you will see parallels of things that he talks about in this letter, you'll see parallels of different things that he has heard from his Savior, from his Lord. And I want to go back just to one when he talks about here in verse 14, but he says, but even if you should suffer for righteous sake, you are blessed. That wasn't something that Peter just made up. He had heard that. He heard that from his Savior when he listened to the, to the Sermon on the Mount. And back in Matthew chapter 5, and I'm going to read verses 10 and 11. Peter was there when Jesus preached this message. He was there. So in verse chapter 5, verse 10, he says, this is Jesus speaking, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on in verse 11, he says, And blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. He says great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So he's saying, Peter's saying, listen, if you suffer for righteousness, you are in very good company because they did it to the prophets who were before us and before this dispersed group of believers. So suffer for righteousness. And he says, if you do that, then you are blessed. And we talked about last week how that blessed actually meant. It doesn't mean that you're happy as it means in other uh, verses where we read the word blessed. But here it actually means that you are honored or you are privileged if indeed you suffer for righteous sake. 
Now, suffering for righteous sake, all, many of us are going to either do this or we have done this or we are doing it now. Maybe some of us are suffering for righteousness sake. And, you know, I, I think about the young people when I read this verse. When I, when I was studying this recently, I started thinking about young people because it's very difficult being a teenager or a young adult and living saved in this world. It's very, very difficult. I mean, it's difficult for us adults, too, us more mature adults. Ain't nobody here old. We're all more mature. We don't got no old folks in here, do we? We're all mature. Or we're younger, but no old folks. But as a teenager, as a young adult, the pressures that you have daily is unbelievable. And you have to hold on to what you believe in Jesus Christ. You have to hold on to that. And that's why Peter says in the very next verse, he says, and do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, because the world does threaten. They threaten to isolate you. They threaten to, uh, to, to ostracize you. They threaten to not be around you. They threaten to, you know, to, to disregard you. They threaten to dismiss you. They threaten to uh, not include you, to exclude you and things. They threaten that. And for a young person, that is a threat because young people want to belong. Young people want to be uh, a peer. They don't want to be looked at upon as being different. They don't want that. They want to be looked upon as being uh, with everyone else and being as everyone else. But the truth of the matter is when you walk with Jesus Christ, that cannot happen. As much as you want that to happen, it cannot happen. And so Peter said here, don't, don't be afraid of your threats and don't be afraid of the trouble. Don't be troubled by them, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's what you do. Don't be afraid. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That means make him the priority in your life. Make him the king that sits on the throne of your heart, not the people, not the world age, not the world's pleasures. Not your own selfishness, but let the Lord be the one who sits on the throne of your heart. Honor him in everything that you do. Honor him in everywhere that you go. Honor him in the people that you allow to be a part of your circle. Honor him. And he says, when you do that, then you then always be ready to give a defense for everyone who will ask you. Because when you honor the Lord your lifestyle will show the difference. Your lifestyle will show the difference. And even when you go through that, those adversities, you will go through it with joy when everyone else may go through it with despair. You will have hope when everyone else may be discouraged. So he says here, when you, when you go through these things, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. And always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you the question. What is the reason for the hope that's in you? And sometimes you need to, to, to think about that because our world is not always going to be perfect. We are going to suffer even when we shouldn't. But Paul has some very encouraging words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8. He says, we are hard pressed on every side. Yes, society will do that. They will press us on every side. But Paul says, yet you are not crushed. He said, we are perplexed, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but yet we are not forsaken. We never go through these things alone. We're never forsaken. Then he says that we're cast down, but we're not destroyed. You can talk about us. You can slander us. You can beat us down, but it won't take our spirit. It won't take what we know that we have. It doesn't matter what you say about us. You can't take what Jesus Christ has given us and we will get back up. The Bible says a, a good man will fall down seven times and get back up. We can be beat down. Sin may get to us. Uh, temptation may get to us, but we get back up. We get back up. And we grab hold of what we know to be true, and that's the hand and the word of Jesus Christ. Amen? So for young people, I just think about that, and it's very difficult, and that's why it's important for us as adults to always make ourselves available for young people, to pour into them, make ourselves available to be an example, 
make ourselves available to them so that they can come and talk to us and ask us questions so they don't feel alone because sometimes they don't have a peer that they can speak to their own age who can help them sometimes because their peer group may not have another believer. So let's make ourselves available to our young men and our young women. So then he says here that we do that with meekness and fear. And verse 16 says, having a good conscience, having a good conscience. That means that, look, I'm not living a double life. I'm not doing anything that I'm ashamed of that I, that I have to hide. I'm not worried about running into people who may expose something that I've done that I'm trying to hide from everybody. Having a good conscience, a good conscience. And even having a good conscience, even when I tell you about the Lord, I'm not telling you about him with condemnation. I'm not telling about you with a, a condescending attitude. I'm not condemning you. So I have a good conscience even in a way that I talk to you about the Lord. I'm not, I'm not stumbling you about the way that I talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. See, it's important to have good confidence because, see, confidence, when he talks about having good confidence, that means that's the inner confidence that we are endeavoring to live what we proclaim and what we believe. A good conscience is an inner confidence that either approves our right actions and our attitudes or it accuses them. That's a good conscience. When I'm doing right, it approves of what I'm doing. When I'm doing wrong, it lets me know that what I'm doing is wrong. That's a good conscience. And it's important to have a good conscience because it strengthens us in those times of adversity. A good conscience will give us peace when everything outside of us is chaotic. A good confidence removes fear. It removes the fear of man. If I'm in Christ Jesus and if I'm walking with the Lord, then I have no reason to be afraid. Psalm 119.6 says, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? I don't have to be, I don't have to fear if I'm in good standing with the Lord Jesus Christ, if I'm endeavoring through the power of the Holy Spirit to please him and to live for him. Now, Peter is not saying, you know, when we, when we, when we, when he looks at verse 17 and he says, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than it is for doing evil. He's not saying, look, go and find opportunities that you can, you know, where you can suffer. He's not saying that. He's not saying go and, and find ways that, uh, that you can suffer so you can look holy and righteous and self-righteous and all. That's not what he's saying. He's not talking false humility here. But what Peter is actually saying is that we will suffer because Jesus told us that everyone who will live godly all that will live godly. Paul told us that all who will live godly will suffer persecution. So there's going to be some suffering. But he's saying that when you do suffer, make sure that you're suffering for righteousness and not suffering because of something that you did. Not suffering because of something self-inflicted. You're not suffering because you're an evildoer or because you've lied or because you're a thief or because of reasons. In fact, you know, in fact, the word here says back in, back over here in chapter 2, verse 19, he says, for it is commendable, 2 and 19, he says, for it is commendable of conscience toward God, one endures grief or suffering wrongfully. Verse 20 says, for what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults and you take it patiently, but when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. And this is another parallel experience that Peter had. Because back in chapter 4 of Acts, Peter and John were walking. He was asking for money, but Peter said, look, I ain't got no money, but what I have I'm going to give to you. And Peter prayed for this young man, and this man, he became healed, and he was able to walk. And of course, those who were of the Pharisees and those, you know, the, the, the elite righteous, they didn't like that. So they end up calling Peter in and, and they pulled Peter and, and, and John in and they asked them all these questions. Who, who gives you the authority to do this? And who gives you authority to do that? How are you speaking and preaching in this name? And then, of course, eventually they were beaten because they were preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. They were beaten. They were beaten because they did a good thing. They healed a man and preached in the name of the one who healed him. 
And that made them angry and they beat them. So when Peter says, you know, look, even if you are beaten for your faults and you take it patiently, that's commendable to God. But if you're a murderer, a thief, or an evildoer, and you're beaten for that, and you take it patiently, there's no glory. God doesn't get no glory for that because that's not commendable to the Lord. This is what Peter is saying here. And he understands that because Peter went through that. He dealt with that. So when we, when we suffer, and we will, if we take it patiently, that means we're not murmuring and complaining and not protesting and all these other things and becoming violent and, and meeting evil with evil and meeting violence with violence. We're not doing all those things, but we're taking it patiently. We're believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're, 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 we're trusting in him, trusting in the Lord to take care of it. And again, I'll repeat this, the same verse that we talked about last time over in chapter 2, verse 23. Jesus being the example of being just that. It says when he was reviled, he did not revile again. And in re- he did not revile in return. And when he suffered, he didn't threaten. But he committed himself to him who judges righteously. There's only one that you're really concerned about what he thinks of you. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ, God himself. That's the only one you need to be concerned about. About what he thinks of you. So he moves on here and he comes to verse 18. And in verse 18 here, this is a real sensitive part of the scripture because it talks about Jesus Christ as being this example of suffering. And he says this in verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. He talks about suffering here, and I want to take my time with this portion because I know that we all know that Jesus suffered, and we all talk about the fact that he suffered. But I think it's a good idea to just go back and look at how he suffered. Sometimes it's a good idea to to go back and just look at true sacrifice that he made for us. And I say it was for us because as the scripture said, he suffered once for sins. And that right there lets you know that he didn't suffer for himself because Jesus was a man without sin. That means he suffered for us, our sins. Look at what it says over here in chapter 2, verse 24. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we having died to sins might live for righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. So this suffering, this suffering once, the reason why it's emphasized that he suffered once because back in the Old Testament, when they did the Old Testament sacrifices, the animal sacrifices, the annual animal sacrifices, they were ongoing. There was a sacrifice every day and of course there were yearly sacrifices. But those sacrifices only covered sin. Those sacrifices couldn't take away sin because the the blood of bulls and goats doesn't take away sin. It covers it. So they had to do these sacrifices over and over and over again. The priest first had to do it for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus Christ only had to do it once. And it was done. So we no longer, there no longer has to be a sacrifice for sins. There no longer has to be blood shed for sins. Jesus did it. He did it all. He paid it all. He paid it all. But this suffering wasn't just him hanging on the cross. That wasn't the totality of his suffering. His suffering actually began when he was in front of Pontius Pilate and and, and even before he was sentenced. Because Pilate could not just release him because of the magnitude of of the people that were coming against Jesus and wanting him to be crucified and wanting him to be put to death, Pontius felt pressured to do something. And even before Jesus was, sent, was sentenced, the Bible says over in John chapter 19, verse 1, that they took Jesus and they scourged him. I don't know how many of you know what scourging is, but in the Old Testament, the Romans they would scourge the severe criminals. 
And this scourging was actually with a tool, and it was a, like a whip-type tool. And this whip, the handle, was connected to about nine strips of leather. And at the end of the leather were pieces of glass and pieces of wire and hooks and pieces of sharp metal, even pieces of bones, animal bones, was connected to the ends of these whips, these tails. In fact, they were even called cat nine tails because usually it was about nine strips of leather that was connected to this whip. So what they would do, they would take the criminal, they would bring him into a place, there was a pole that was standing up, and they would have the criminal hug the pole, basically, lean over the pole, tie his hands together, he would bend them over, and then they would bear his back. Jewish law said you can only give about 40 whips, no more than 40 slashes. And they usually would do 40 less ones, so it would be 39 slashes in Jewish law. But it was the Romans that did this. And they didn't have no sort of a number that they had to uh, adhere to. So they just basically beat you until you're almost dead. So as this whip is being swung on the back of our Savior, the purpose of it is to shred your flesh. So it's like he was being skinned with this thing because every time he hit they would pull it out and it would just bring out flesh. Hit again and pull out skin and bring out flesh. And it was akin to the Old Testament sacrifice because in Leviticus chapter 1, if you start reading around verse 3, it starts telling you about how the sacrifices were done by the priests. And they would kill the animal, drain the blood, and then they would skin them. It was a bloody, bloody sacrifice in the Old Testament. And this issue with Jesus, this scourging, was bloody. It wasn't just that they put him up on the cross. Before he even got to the cross, he was severely beaten. Before he was even sentenced. So they were beat him with this, 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 this whip-like thing. This flagrum is what it's called. This flagrum. And they would, they would hit him and they would pull the skin off beating them and pull the skin off. And, and, and doing these things, oftentimes, the muscles would be exposed. And then sometimes even the bone was exposed. And for some people, they were beaten so bad that organs were exposed. This was a brutal, brutal beating. And I can't even begin to try to describe what, what that kind of pain would be. I have no idea. I have no reference for what that kind of pain would be like. And that, and our Savior had to deal with that, to be beat that way. And that was before they put the crown of thorns on his head and stuck the spikes of those thorns into his skull. Then they would take him and put a, a cross on him. He would have to carry it at the Galgaga on his back. And that's why you read where he had to get help because his body was so beaten, he was so weak how he would even be able to take a few steps, let alone to even make it to Golgotha and still be alive was amazing. And then, of course, once they got him to Golgotha, they would put him on the cross, nails through his wrists, his feet, and he's basically hanging there until he dies. I have no reference for that kind of suffering. What you've heard today is just one message from a series going through 1st and 2nd Peter. Pastor Lewis is teaching through this series here on Living Waters of Grace. If you're new to this program, we have two pastors who alternate teachings. Pastor Clark and Pastor Lewis also teach at Calvary Chapel Westmoreland in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. If you are interested in hearing more messages like this one, head on over to calvarychapelonline.com and find the Listen tab. We trust that what you've heard here on the radio will make an impact in your everyday life. Calvary Chapel Westmoreland is located at 207 Hudson Street in Greensburg, Pennsylvania. If you're in the area, we'd love to see you this Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Head over to our website, calvarychapelonline.com for more information. 
we offer a live stream of the services for those who live further away. We also wanted you to be aware that we'll be moving our radio station from 100.3 to 91.7 in the near future. Please pray about helping support the new station that will reach thousands more listeners. If God has placed it on your heart to support this new station, feel free to send gifts to Grace FM, PO Box 716, Greensburg, Pennsylvania, 15601. Thanks for considering this opportunity and thanks for listening today. There's so much more to look forward to in this series as Pastor Lewis continues to teach through the writings of Peter. If you're ever in the place where you feel like no one can relate to unjust suffering while taking a stand for Christ, Peter is your God. His experience is something to hold on to. We'll be here again on Living Waters of Grace.